So uh, very quickly, again, we're looking at the teleological argument. We're looking at the different propositions and we're looking at the common objections raised by atheists regarding these propositions and then how we can respond uh, to that. So as we said, when we look at the argument, there's various ways we can respond or present the teleological argument <coughs> and ways that we can also respond. Uh, because one way of looking at it is, is by uh, the statements regarding the possibilities of there being a creator and having three possible options. One is that this universe that we see, that we see mastery in, was either created or was, was there because it was there, as in that's the way it was supposed to be or that it's just all happened by coincidence, or that there, there is a wise and willing creator. In other words, it's been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now let's look at the objections to the first proposition. <clears throat> if you recall, now, when it comes to the uh, objections, the whole idea is that we've, we've come to the conclusion that the rational evidences indicate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is um, the cause of the systemization and the mastery and the immaculateness that we see uh, within the universe. Now, some of them are going to now object uh, to these uh, propositions. So the first one is the universe is masterfully and immaculately made, as in you see beauty, fine tuning and so on within the universe. So now the first objection is, and again, this is, a, as you will see, especially with these fine tuning arguments, that many of these arguments are actually quite weak and show desperation on the part of the atheists to try and give some kind of response to something which is quite apparent. And in fact, as we will soon see, many atheists have also admitted to the fine tuning of the universe as we uh, one of the examples we gave in the previous weeks was of Anthony Flew who was a famous atheist who became uh, who at least accepted in some form of God on the basis of the arguments related to fine tuning uh, even Richard Dawkins you know who's seen as considered as one of the leaders of the atheist world uh, he even he, he admits to the fact that the fine-tuning argument seems to be the strongest argument presented by those who believe in God. Obviously, he doesn't accept it, but he at least uh, admits to the fact that there is strength in that particular argument. So what's the objection? How are they going to object to this uh, argument? Now, some atheists, and again, you'll see that it's, <clears throat> it's a kind of a strange objection. You will see some of the atheists who will reject this mastery and greatness in the universe. And you will find some who are skeptical whether the universe is uh, masterfully made. And therefore they will come up with certain kind of objections to this. So one of them is that they claim that our reading of the universe is an illusion. As in, we think there is mastery and beauty and fine tuning in the universe, but all of that is just deception. It's just an illusion. And even though it has no objective meaning in the universe, again, the argument they're trying to say is that, in other words, all of the mastery around us does not necessarily mean that there was a masterful process of the construction per se. So, and again, we'll give you some examples so that you kind of understand this. So, for example, if we see a sculpture of a human being, we would all <clears throat> kind of appreciate that someone made it, right? Because, you know, when we're looking at it on, on, on it, uh, you know, and when you know human beings, we would assume that for this structure to be in this particular form, there must have been someone who put it together. Uh, you know, and if it was assumed that some creation never saw, so the argument is that, if we assume that some uh, creation never saw a human, they don't know what a human is like in their entire life, they might 
pass by the culture, uh, sculpture without noting any feature of mastery therein, right? It would almost appear just like a regular rock in a random shape, right? Because they've never seen human beings before and therefore they won't see the beauty of it being in the form of a human being, rather they will see some randomness there uh, without there being any intervention by a sculpture or someone who is willingly designing the sculpture in this particular way. I hope you're following the argument. In the same way, if there is someone <coughs> who doesn't understand language, uh, who can't, for example, read, e even if they were to see uh, something like uh, a book by uh, Shakespeare, right, with, uh, you know, sentences and words and so on, for them, it would still appear to be something which is just random scribbles, right? Because, and so therefore, the argument is that when we claim that there is beauty, we are projecting our views uh, onto, uh, onto uh, this claim. Now, again, this is a kind of a desperation um, because um, it actually contradicts what, what they're trying to claim. Um, and as we will soon see, uh, one of the most uh, important proponents of this particular argument in modern times um, will, uh, in one of his writings, um, tries to demonstrate this point uh, sorry, we've gone to a second thing. Uh, the, the whole problem with this particular argument is that if you go by that argument, you can't do anything in life because the fact is that this objection kind of contradicts itself because when you look at the sculpture, sculpting of a rock by a, a willing actor, as in someone who's now made this rock in the shape of a human being, or if you see a set of letters and a script belonging to a specific language, then that in itself will demonstrate beauty. You reveal mastery as an objective reality in these matters, right? Your knowledge of this is then developed to further appreciate the beauty and the mastery. So whatever masterful construct exists in the universe, it would carry on increasing our experiences and knowledge. In other words, the more you study the universe, the better you understand it, the better you appreciate its beauty and its mastery. So this process of discovery will continue to remain an experience by which we appreciate something further. And so this form of thinking almost leads to a person to, uh, to negate all objective reality. So uh, if you see any beauty anywhere, then you have to assume that that beauty is not there. You're just assuming that beauty, you're imposing your view on it. And, and the truth is that this kind of sophisticated form of argumentation um, leads to very problematic positions in your life. Because whenever you see anything, like even if you see a great piece of artwork, your answer again would be, this is just randomness and I'm imposing my view on this thing to make the claim that it's beautiful. Imagine you see a beautiful house. Again, the argument would be the same. You're imposing your view on it. In reality, it's just randomness. Uh, you come across an amazing book and you read it and it's beautiful. Again, you're imposing your view on it. So as you can see, no human being can behave in this way in their day-to-day -day life, in this particular way, with this kind of weak argument. Your whole fitra denies that thing, right? When you, when you see the awesomeness of the universe, right? And you might have seen some of the recent images coming out. Straight away, your fitra admits to the fact of immense beauty. And to try and say that, no, this is just you imposing something uh, it becomes a very weak argument and therefore very few people can kind of willingly uh, adopt this particular position. So that's the first objection. Quite, quite easily you can dismiss it and respond to it. The second objection is uh, again um, primarily and we'll come to the individual very soon. I think I might have his image somewhere. 
Yeah, Victor Stenger. Uh, Victor Stenger, again, an atheist, who has uh, written a book called The Fallacy of the Fine Tuning, Why the Universe is not designed for us. Now, we'll deal with him later and his arguments very soon. And again, you might find when you're discussing uh, Gorap, when you're trying to prove the existence of God, you might see an atheist um, present his book. Uh, so it's important to, again, you might not, again, and don't worry about the details and not fully understanding all of the arguments in detail, as long as you have a basic idea that there is something out there and there is a way to respond to these kind of arguments. But interestingly, uh, even in his book, when he wrote his book to try and deny uh, the uh, fine tuning, uh, he had a bit of a problem. And the problem was that even atheists uh, accepted to a certain degree what we discussed previously known as the anthropic principle, right, regarding the fine tuning of the universe. And the fact is that the list of people who believe in the fine tuning of the universe is extremely lengthy and comprises some of the well-known modern day scientists and physicists. Uh, and again, we're not even talking about Muslim scholars and theologians and so on. But, you know, there's a whole list of people, you know, Barrow, Carr, Carter, Davis, Dawkins, uh, Green, Harrison, Hawking. And I'll mention some of them very soon who have actually written and express amazement at the phenomenon of the precise fine tuning of the universe. So here you have, for example, Robert Harrison. And here he says, here is the cosmological proof for the existence of God, the design argument of Paley updated and refurbished. He's talking about the design argument, the fine tuning argument of the universe. And he says, the fine tuning of the universe provides prima facie evidence of deistic design, as in design by God or supernatural. So take your choice. Blind chance that requires multitude of universes, which is, again, the argument of the atheists, and we'll talk about the multi-universe argument later on, or design that requires only one. Many scientists, when they admit their views, incline towards the teleological or design argument. So he is now a prominent scholar already saying that actually there's many scientists who do inclined towards the design argument. It has a lot of strength. You have Stephen Hawking. He says, the laws of science as we know them at present contain many fundamental numbers, like the size of the electric charge of the electron and the ratio of the masses of the proton and the electron. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been finely adjusted to make possible the development of life, right? And again, we've looked at this in quite more detail in the past. So, you know, why was it possible for life to exist in the universe, right? Because the chances of life not existing are far, 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 far more greater than the possibility of life. So then we have to explain how is it possible? And the fine tuning argument is one of these arguments. You have also Professor Francis Collins. And again, I recommend those who can get hold of this book uh, to read his book uh, because he's considered one of the leading scholars on the genome project, right? Looking at the DNA and so on. And in his book, The Language of God, uh, his basic argument is that science and faith are compatible and deserve a wide hearing, right? And he's actually saying that it is, uh, you know, even those people who do not go to churches um, will need to accept this reality. And he argues that the precise tuning of all the physical constants and the physical laws to make intelligent life possible is not an accident, but reflects the actions of the one who created the universe in the first place. You have also <coughs> another uh, uh, scholar um, who's written um, uh, in, and is well-known physician, Michael Anthony Corey. He writes that the stupendous degree of fine-tuning 
that instantly existed between these fundamental parameters following the Big Bang reveals a miraculous level of microengineering that is simply inconceivable in the absence of a super calculating designer. Look, again, the whole point is we're not quoting Muslim theologians who maybe don't know anything about science and so on. We'll, we're actually quoting well-known, well-established scholars, scientists who are coming out with, these, uh, with this information. You have, again, uh, here, professor who's a famous astronomer, uh, George Greenstein. Uh, he has a book, Quantum Strangeness, as well. And he says, as we survey the evidence, the thought instantly arises that some supernatural agency or other agency, obviously talking about God here, must be involved. Is, is it possible that suddenly, without in intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? Uh, you have again here uh, another theoretical physicist, uh, Tony Rothman. He adds that the medieval theologians who gaze in the night sky through the eyes of Aristotle and saw angels moving the spheres in harmony has become the modern cosmologist who gauge, gazes at the same sky through the eyes of Einstein and sees the hand of God now in the angels, be but in the constants of nature. And then he says, when confronted with the order and beauty of the universe and the strange coincidences of nature, it is very tempting to take the leap of faith from science to religion. And I'm sure many physicists want to, and I only, I only wish they would admit it. So unfortunately, what the problem is, many of these scholars, scientists, physicists are looking at the universe and they know that they have to now make the leap of admitting that they, this universe would not have happened without a supernatural cause, a, a creator. Uh, but unfortunately, many of them, for whatever reasons at times, do not admit that particular fact. So now let's go back to Strenger. And why is it that he's trying to <clears throat> put together? Now, he pro his proposal focuses on a number of data points. Again, you don't need to worry about the details of the numbers right now. I'll give you a basic response to his summary, his argument later on. Uh, but he argues that, or, that the, the calculations uh, regarding some of the constants. So he's basically trying to reply to some of the other scholars, many we've just mentioned just now, and many others who've actually looked at these constants to show that there is fine tuning. And he basically says that the margin of error is larger than what some of the researchers claim, as in some of the numbers that they have been given is not as precise. And however, this should, but again, the whole point is that this should not be a problem. The fact that some, you know, some of the constants, you know, they've said, you know, a billion to a billion to a billion to a billion, you know, if they got a billion wrong, it still doesn't make a way, make much of a difference. Even if his calculations are right and the others are wrong, the argument from fine tuning would still be intact. The argument would not go. And that's why actually, um, many scholars have responded to this individual, and uh, one of the kind of uh, strongest responses that have been written uh, is by uh, uh, pr uh, Professor Barnes, and um, he has actually written several scientific papers titled The Fine-Tuning of the Universe for Intelligent Life. And it is a robust, lengthy critique of much of what Stenger has written in his Stenger has written in his book. And in fact, it was so robust and um, it, it even led to Stenger trying to, uh, uh, because Barnes actually uh, accused Stenger of perpetrating many scientific facts or scientific errors. He, he made several errors in his calculations. And that's why um, 
Stenger tried to do a 12 page response to Bonds. And then immediately after that, Bonds wrote another response back to him. And basically, uh, Bonds looks at the arguments presented by Stenger and he demonstrates that uh, he's made many errors in his argument. And uh, again, I don't want to go to the technicalities, otherwise it becomes very precise. You know, so for example, when it comes to the cali calibration between the electrons and the proton mass, you know, what is more, we can argue that the electron mass is going to much smaller than the proton masses and so on. I don't want to get into the technicalities. The whole point is that the Uh, the whole set of constants that capture life uh, is not confined to a single set of constants in our universe, rather it's possible to create other sequences. This is what uh, 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 the uh, Stenger is trying to say, that, you know, these constants or the, that have been come up with in terms of the fine tuning is possible to create other sequences uh, and that could also capture life and therefore it Creates a broad, it broadens the scope of chances of a chain coming as an accident and so on. Uh, but uh, very quickly, some following observations can be made to his idea. Firstly, even if it is true that some constants, uh, it, it's true of some constants, it is not necessarily true for other cosmological constants or specific events. And one of the requisite parameters for the existence of life is independent parameters. And it would appear that even the slightest disruption, if someone could please unmute themselves so that we don't have any disturbance, uh, it would appear that even the slightest, Afsal, if you could please unmute yourself, uh, the slightest disruption to them would lead to the universe becoming unsuitable for life. So, no matter what um, argument is given, it still doesn't take away the fact that there is precision within the universe. So uh, the number of possible series unable to sustain life are far, far more than those that are able to sustain life. In fact, there's no comparison between the two. So the objection does not answer that fundamental question, which is, how were their physical constants determined? Because the probability of one set of constants that can comprise of life to the exclusion of many other sets of constants that do not is highly unlikely. And so the question is, what was this set of constants that selected and not any other? Uh, again, the summary of it is in summary, the probabilities of fine tuning and the balancing act in the required manner are far, far greater, and, and sorry, astronomically smaller compared to the rival possibilities. And that's why even someone like Richard Dawkins says, but however many ways there may be of being alive, it is certain that there are vastly more ways of being dead rather than alive. In other words, for us to be alive in this universe, for that to happen, the, uh, the probability of that happening is so, so, so astronomically small compared up to the possibility of non-life, that therefore there needs to be an explanation of why was it possible for life to be in this universe. And the most Tenger is attempting to do is minimize the possibilities that are not in the interest of the universe and to maximize the possibilities are in the, in, in the interest. But, and to give you a, a very quick way of understanding this, I know some of these points are quite technical. At least you have an idea that, okay, there's some response out there. Now, imagine a person who said, that the probability of something, let's imagine something occurring, is one in a billion, 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 billion. And then someone says, no, 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 it's not one in a billion, billion, it's a hundred in a billion, billion, billion. That's all Stenger was doing, right? He's basically trying to, even though he's, 
his numbers have been disputed. But the most he was trying to say is that, okay, it's not one in a billion, billion, billion. It's a hundred in a billion, 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 billion. So one would think that even that, the probability of its occurrence is still, in either case, extremely low. And that's the whole point of the fine tuning argument. So um, irrespective of which way they look at it, the argument still remains. Finally, before we just finish, I don't know if you've got time. I I'll leave this uh, for next week. Um, uh, but next week, what we also want to do, because uh, we'll be looking at the second proposition, and the second proposition is actually to do with evolution. Um, and I know we do have a recorded series of lectures on that as well, but we'll be looking at is evolution, because again, unfortunately, many people think evolution is a response to the existence of the creator. So hopefully, um, I'll very quickly go through some of the remaining arguments regarding the objections to the first proposition, and then hopefully we'll spend a bit more time on whether evolution is a justifiable argument for the non-existence of the creator. Uh, inshallah, we'll, that will be our discussion uh, for next week. So inshallah, if you have any questions, um, please uh, put it in the chat box.